Um, I'm Peter Lowen. I'm the director uh, of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, and it's my real pleasure today to join all of you uh, in joining with uh, Stephen Toop to talk about his, his new book. Uh, before we do that, I do want to acknowledge the land uh, on which the University of Toronto operates. It has, as you know, for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and most recently the, um, uh, sorry, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, and it is, it is our great privilege, so we say it, uh, it remains true no matter how many times we say it, that it's our great privilege to live and to work and to thrive um, on this land. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Stephen to uh, talk about the book. I've got some, uh, some questions for him. Um, we'll do that for about 20, 25 minutes, and then I'll encourage you to ask questions, and we'll do it by, uh, by show of hands. I'll remind you that a question ends with an interrogatory at the end and with your voice going up, okay? <laughs> so uh, we'll look forward to it. But Stephen, welcome back to Monk. Um, as you know, Stephen was, was director here for a time and is a distinguished fellow with us and is a great friend of the school. Um, so I just wanted to start by asking you, if I could, to just, just give us... Uh, Give us the, the rundown in the book. As you know, in grad school, there's two types of books. There's books you've read, and there's books you've read yourself. <laughs> and I read this one myself. But for everyone who hasn't read it, what's the, what's the central argument of the book? Oh, dear. I'm a, I was afraid he was going to ask that. That's a, it's a tough question, because it's a funny kind of book. Uh, it's a book we were talking earlier. I think it's the sort of book that you can only imagine writing, uh, uh, I won't say at the end of a career, but after you've been around for a while and you've done a few different things. And it's been a book that I've, I've actually wanted to write for quite a long time because it tries to tie together uh, a lot of work uh, that I've done in different fields over a number of years and also tried to pull in very practical experiences that I've had in other fields of life uh, as a, uh, Special Rapporteur for the United Nations. I talk about that a little bit. I talk about the experience of being the leader of a university a little bit. But all to make some points about where I think the world is today and where it might go. So the bottom line is it's an attempt to create uh, a way of thinking about law that I think builds hope for the future. And that's where the age of anxiety comes in. I'm, I am really concerned, and I, I'm sure so many of you are, when you talk to friends and relatives, never mind in the academic world, there is a prevailing sense of anxiety, I think. And the book starts with uh, references to mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was partly what really got me thinking about this, the number of times that I talk to students uh, and faculty members and staff members at great universities who were talking about mental health. Uh, and it made me think, why are people so anxious? W what's the cause of all of that? And of course, there's no single answer to that. So the first part of the book tries to lay out some reasons for the prevailing anxiety of our society. I'll leave that aside. We can come back mm -hmm. to it. The second part of the book then goes back and, and essentially tries to recapture what I think are some really promising lines of thinking uh, that actually could help us overcome some of that anxiety. It starts with Aristotle uh, and the notion of practical reason or practical wisdom, and then it moves into uh, thinking about uh, 19th century philosophers who were interested in process. And then it goes to the pragmatists that came out of the United States. Dewey, great you know, theorist of education, uh, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and others, who I think helped us understand that we learn best by doing. And that's not a, a uh, an unusual thing to say, although it may be an unusual thing to say in a university, mm -hmm. uh, but we mm -hmm. learn best by doing, and that it is through practice that we actually develop our most instructive insights about how to frame our own lives mm -hmm. and how potentially to think about the world in a happier way. And then I try to link that to some work that Yuta Brunet and I, Yuta sitting over there, have done over a number of years to think through uh, how law is actually created. And I tie together this tradition of pragmatism to the work that we've done on how law actually functions, all building towards the rule of law or 
a rule of law, that's purposeful, mm -hmm. uh, that I think if it's modest and if it's rooted in practices and if it doesn't seek uh, an imperial role for the societal organization that we all need, that could actually help us feel more confident about the future. So that's sort of the grand trajectory of the book. There are obviously a lot of arguments buried in there. Mm -hmm. Let's get into them. So, so what I want to do is I want to talk about the, the three things you identify as the sort of drivers of this anxiety. Uh, and there's an order in which, uh, which, you, which you present them and, and we'll talk about them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about risk and uncertainty, which you, which mm -hmm. you use to frame up this, this moment that we're, that we're in, and then to ask you about what this modest rule of law constitutes and how it, how it should really shape our thinking, because I will say that the conclusion I got from it is that it's, it's, um, it's unsatisfyingly difficult in the sense that it asks you to think about things in a way that's not black and white. Um, Very and much is, so. And is really about practice. So you, you identify three sets of, of drivers of anxiety or underwriters of anxiety, and I'd like you to just talk through why you think these are underwriters of anxiety. And they are, in reverse order, they are uh, the rise of new technologies, globalization, and, and, uh, and populism. So wh why do you think those three things are the, are the drivers of anxiety, as opposed to, you know, uh, climate change, right. economic inequality, any, any number of other things that, that so might I, be. So I purposely bracket climate change, uh, and I, I try to explain that a little mm -hmm. bit, but I should say something about it, because I do think it is the existential question of our era. And the reason I bracket it is because so many people have worked on it, and so many people have very, uh, I think, instructive things to say. And in a sense, I'm happy to adopt all of those, mm -hmm. and I do think that climate anxiety does pervade uh, many parts of the world today. Um, so I, I don't want to say it's not important, but I just felt I didn't have anything really useful and new to say about it that hadn't already been said by some really smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, looked at uh, nationalist populism because I think it includes the question of inequality. Yes. Uh, and that's really fundamental. It, it, part of the argument of the book is, it's not irrational for people to be attracted to populist answers in our era yes. because there, in fact, is really very pervasive inequality that has grown over the course of the last 50 years. The U.S. is probably the most unequal uh, Western society. And the UK, where I was living when I was writing this book, was, had the fastest increase mm -hmm. in inequality mm -hmm. of all states. And I think it's not, therefore, entirely surprising that Brexit happens in the UK and that uh, we also have, of course, the Trumpist mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. which is no longer a moment and may, in fact, be a era. We'll see. It may well be. Uh, may very well be. And so uh, populism, I think, is rooted in really profound senses of inequality and unfairness and hopelessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the stats that I think is most important to pull upon is, is the feeling that has increased uh, in most Western societies uh, and in other parts of the world as well, that the next generation will not be better off than the generation before. And if you think about it, since the 1950s, the American dream, the Canadian dream, the British dream, whatever, the French dream, has been that your kids are going to be better off than you. Yes. That's no longer true. And yes. so I think that populism has a real logical grounding. The problem is it then allies with nativism and it allies with exclusivity and, and notions of the people mm -hmm. that are uh, narrow, that are uh, confining for the people themselves and of course that create the them and us. And that's where populism becomes deeply mm -hmm. worrisome mm -hmm. and then allies with nationalism. Yes. So that's, the, that's one piece uh, of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle is the rise not only of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, which of course, as we all know, is really causing a lot of people to be uncertain about what the future really looks like, and we can come back to that. But it's also the dominating network platforms on which these new technologies either run or allow people or, or shape the uh, interactions of people in our societies. And I think it's the combination of those two things 
the fact that uh, as the uh, there's a wonderful quote from uh, the um, EU Commissioner on Competition, um, and she said that it's not Google, you're not searching Google, Google is searching you. And that's an accurate description in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that sense that we are losing control, we're losing control of our ability to shape our own lives, mm -hmm to understand who we're interacting with and privacy concerns and even concerns about humanity mm -hmm. and whether mm -hmm. it is being undermined in fundamental ways, both by the network platforms and by these new technologies is, is key. Yes. And then the last piece, and I think it all ties it together in many ways, is the notion of globalization, which of course has changed dramatically. Globalization in the uh, immediate uh, post-fall of the Berlin Wall moment was looking highly promising. You know, in, there were going to be logical interconnections of supply chains, although admittedly there were also going to be lowering of wages mm -hmm. because we were mm -hmm. seeking out uh, low-wage opportunities for building things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was also going to be, though, in a more positive way, greater uh, societal intercommunication, et cetera. Well, that started, though, to generate a sense of nervousness in communities that felt that they were being left behind, and in communities, and that ties back to the populism, and in communities where jobs were being lost, and that was happening around the world. And um, I also think, you know, people like Ignatiev, Michael, uh, started writing about uh, the ordinary virtues and whether or not we were losing track of what it was that actually helped people feel connected to other people in their communities. So I think all of that generated a sense of reaction and nervousness, mm -hmm. but in the reaction and nervousness, we then prompted other reactions as counter reactions, mm -hmm. and we go back to populism and the fear that that's generated in many communities. So I think you tie all of that together and you put climate change into the mix yes. and, and a fundamental sense of inequality. And we do live in an age, I think, that has caused people to feel disconnected, mm -hmm. nervous, fearful of the future, and fearful that it won't get any better for their kids. By the way, of course, all of this happening at a time when empirically in many parts of the world we're better off than we ever have been. Yes. yes. Right? So that we can't lose that side. There's a strangeness to this. Yes. And there's a strangeness to the mental health challenges and the yes. anxieties. Yes. We're not living in the Second World War. We're not living in the Depression. A lot of people are way better off than they've ever been. Yes. I mean, there is, there is, a, there is an unmooring of... of uh, of perception from reality uh, in, in the, on material matters. There's an argument you make at the end of the chapter on populism, which you don't make as explicitly about globalization and technological change, and it's that populism has actually been eroding internationally of the rule of law, or it's been deprecating the rule of law. Yeah. It does it internationally, actually, and domestically. And it domestic. does it domestically through things like you use the example of Trump, but but we could use many others of, of, of leaders who are who are working very hard to Erdogan, Bolsonaro, yes, yes, no longer there, yes, but yes. the new guy in Argentina. Yes, 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 working very hard to free themselves of the of the of the expectations of the rule of law. And you make the argument that, and this I think this is a hard argument to make, but you do it relatively convincingly that populism is underwriting the breakdown of the global international order as well. In, in a, part, in, in order, yeah, in a, in a rules based a rules based order. And it made me, and this is now this is the question of an unreconstructed positivist, <laughs> it made me wonder what, what you think the causal ordering here is. Because you offer the rule of law, a rule of law, as the solution to this anxiety. But I, what as I want, part of the as solution. As part of the solution. Yeah. But what I want to understand is, 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 is the story that, um, that populism and these other forces are eroding things like control, that's eroding people's faith in the rule of law, and that's causing anxiety? Or is the, or is, is, uh, is it that its effect on the rule of law doesn't actually matter, but the rule of law is a solution to this, to this anxiety? Um, I, w I think it's a combination of those two things. So I, I would say that partly what I am trying to argue is that there have been rather conscious efforts to undermine a rule of law, mm -hmm. the, the current version thereof. Mm -hmm. And those efforts are, are prompted in part 
let's take the positive side, because of that sense of lack of control. That, you know, there, the argument is partly that at the international level there's a democratic deficit. Mm -hmm. so people, real people, have trouble influencing the evolution of international law because it's mediated through the state or mediated through uh, other organizations. And that because of that, there's a sense in which there's a kind of imposition of values on societies that may be shifting in their value structures. Yes. And that's the part that I find most intriguing is that many of the most you know, concerted efforts to undermine the rule of law internationally are actually coming from societies that arguably have been the greatest beneficiaries of it mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. obviously under Trump, but to some extent even under Biden in the trade regime. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the great example that I can call upon right now is in the United Kingdom, where clearly uh, there are very direct efforts by some players within the political uh, caste to say that we have to disengage from international rules mm -hmm. and to specifically reject things that the Brits were very involved in creating around immigration, for example, the rules that protect uh, refugees, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the human rights regime mm -hmm. that they're still part of in Europe for the time being, but there are efforts being made to withdraw from those kinds of regimes. Mm -hmm. So I think there's all of that happening. Yes. And I'm also trying to make the case that if we conceptualize the rule of law in a way that doesn't demand that all societies have the same commitment to the good life or the same description of the good life so that it doesn't invoke all of democracy and all of human rights, that we may have a better chance of allowing a rule of law to play out globally mm -hmm. that's more modest in its conception but still has the capacity to help self-organize in societies in ways that are healthy for the potential engagement of citizens. So let's talk about that conception of the rule of law. And this is the part of the book that's hard um, to be sure because it is, it is a, it's a, uh, you position your, and you and you to position your, your, your claims about the rule of law being interactional. It sits between sort of a very legalistic understanding of the law, that the law is just a bunch of rules that, that, that we've set and you have to abide by them. It's nothing more than that or this sense of the rule of law being nothing but the expression of power, right? That it just exactly. being, um, so it sits somewhere in between there as a set of shared norms and understandings and practices about what is acceptable and what is not, and we see it in that dance between citizens and the state in terms of what citizens will allow the state to do in some sense and how the state will push on that. You give some very good examples of that, but just walk us through how we should think about what that what a rule of law is that's modest and that is that, it, that kind of um, is rooted in that notion of, of practical wisdom, and how do we, how is it different than the kind of common conception we might have of what the rule of law is? So back to your sort of initial posing of the question, I think that the rule of law in our world has tended to be caricatured in two different ways. Uh, one way is that the rule of law is a sort of fixed imposition of uh, positivist uh, understandings of what has to exist in a society for it to be a healthy society. Mm -hmm. And uh, it then includes a, a heck of a lot. Uh, so you take the rule of law and it has to include notions of democracy, it has to include notions of rights, it has to include uh, the very structuring of society in ways where law becomes dominant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I both admire and take issue with a wonderful book from the 1960s called Legalism that Judith Schlar wrote. And uh, Judith Schlar was a, a really very uh, impressive uh, political theorist uh, in the States. And she just attacks all, sort of, all legal theory uh, as being um, both homogenous, ultimately, because she says it's just, it's just a, an argument amongst people, all of whom believe that there's only way of thinking of, one way of thinking about the world, which is the legal way, and that it's really the resolution of disputes. Uh, and there's that kind of sense about the rule of law. And then, on the other hand, there's a sense uh, that really, I think, emerges from uh, Schmidt, uh, and is borrowed by a whole series of different contemporary actors, strangely enough, critical theorists mm -hmm. and others, who would suggest 
that law is nothing but politics mm -hmm. and that it's really power that is always the shaper of every decision. And so you've got these two views. Either law is absolutely constraining, and it's constraining either because it's coming from God or from right reason or from a positivist imposition yes. of the state, yes. so it's there, yes. or it's nothing. Yes. And so I'm trying to find, and, and Yuta and I were trying to find a way through to understand law as neither of those two things, but as relatively autonomous, so that it seeks it is largely generated through, first, a platform which you might see as shared expectations within society. And if they don't exist at all, then you've got a real problem creating any law. Mm -hmm. So there's this platform of societal norms, some of which reach the level of legal norms. And we would argue that they are transformed into legal norms through processes that are really procedural. So they're really questions then about whether or not a norm meets certain criteria of legality. Mm -hmm. And there's a great legal theorist named Lon Fuller that we rely on for a lot of that work. And then we argue, and this is where the book in a sense takes off from what we've done previously, mm -hmm. that there's a continuing practice of legality that has to be supported within society or law becomes deconstructed, law mm -hmm. collapses. Mm -hmm. And so taking that understanding of law, I then try to argue that the rule of law is a set of practices that are not deeply value-driven beyond the procedures that are required, but that those procedures or processes are powerful enough to discipline power yes. and powerful enough to help us create frames yes. for the organization of society yes. supporting two essential, more value-laden ideas. One, that humans need autonomy to self-organize in their lives. So it is a liberal conception. Mm -hmm. uh, and though, they also need communication. Yes. And those two yes. things have to be balanced. And that a modest rule of law helps us do that effectively. It allows people to have free exchange about ideas. Free exchange about ideas. Yeah. It, yeah. It allow, and, yes. it, and it also insists that the structures of power within society yes. are also subjected to the same requirements of, of, of the criteria of yes. legality yes. as the average person. Yes. So if I were a student who was trying to uh, find my way in the world with a set of intellectual ideas and, and, and to try to find solutions or, 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 or find an idea that's going to have the fecundity to help me understand a bunch of different things that are happening, why is, why is something like a modest rule of law a, something better than, than glomming onto the idea of community or empathy or justice or, or we, we can go through any number yep. of things. but. But, but why did you, you had to write the book about something, but, but why, is it, why is it making an argument about, about this notion of the rule of law being a solution to this age, age of anxiety, as opposed to other things that we might think are, are, uh, are normatively valuable, like pursuing equality or pursuing right. justice or pursuing community? Uh, I try to make the argument, for example, that justice is in and of itself not a helpful construct because it is too likely to generate utterly diverse opinions. It's no more a uniter. So what I'm trying to find is a, a, is a, a concept that has the capacity to unite mm -hmm. across difference. And uh, empathy might be one of those, yes. although I think it's a, it's a different kind of construct. It might because, also be embedded in communication. But yeah, but exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think it is. Uh, and I do actually talk about the need yes. for empathy in the book. Uh, but I think other conceptions like equality and justice, et cetera, are so laden with concepts that are very culturally specific in many circumstances. One of the things that I'm trying to do is to reach across cultures to some extent. Now, I have to be honest, obviously a lot of the sourcing of the book really does emerge largely from Western sources, but not exclusively. Mm -hmm. I've tried to go out, you know, looking at Maimonides, looking at Confucius, looking at other, uh, other sources as well. But what I think that the, a, a relatively modest view of the rule of law has the capacity to unite in a way that a lot of these other concepts don't, and yes. that's what attracts me to it. Yes. 
Let me ask you one more question, then I want to turn to our, to our colleagues in the audience for, for questions. And it is, um, it's about another anxiety. And I, I want to get your sense of this anxiety, whether it's real and whether a modest rule of law applies to that. There is, there is a belief uh, out there um, that the states that we live in aren't legitimate. That their, 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 their foundings are illegitimate, that their practices continue to be illegitimate, that they are... Um, they might be irretrievably broken on, on some fundamental terms. And, you know, we can, we can go into the kind of specifics of it. People can, can, can fill in the blanks on this about certain beliefs about, about whether democratic states are actually le legitimate actors. And my sense is that that is a serious source of anxiety for people governing societies and for young people coming up in them, right? Is, is a modest rule of law a solution to that anxiety? I, I, I'm presupposing you agree that that's an anxiety, but, but if you do, <laughs> Is a modest rule of law solution to that? So if I may step back for a moment, one of the really important arguments I make is that a modest rule of law is not a solution to anything. Right? Because one of the claims that I'm making in the book is that if you actually understand a, a modest rule of law in the way I try to articulate, it has to interdigitate with other societal frames. Mm. So what, it's really important that law is not an imperial project. I, I quote uh, Nick Kassir from the Supreme Court of Canada, who was one of my colleagues at McGill many years ago, who talks about law as a cosmological project. Mm. It's about who you are, what you want to be. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a shaper, it's not an imp imposer. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that clear yes, that I'm yes. not making an argument that this modest rule of law can address every anxiety fully. Mm -hmm. In fact, what I think is exciting about a modest rule of law is that it helps draw together and potentially create frames that allow other societal optics to play out and to, and to enter into a, an effective discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to avoid your question though. I would say uh, yes, I agree with you that there is a real sense of illegitimacy in, in much of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not, I don't share that, I'll be clear. Um, it's not a view that I would adopt. But I do think that a modest rule of law can help us because what it seeks to call out are the very frames within society that allow us to effectively pursue our own aspirations while engaging effectively with other, I, th we haven't talked about a whole part of the book which, which uh, looks at communities of practice. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think a, a robust legal community of practice can do is help other communities of practice frame their discourses and contribute to an effective um, societal mm -hmm. uh, conversation, if I may put it that way. Mm -hmm. But it's not just a conversation because there are also actions that happen. One of the key points that I make in the book, it's not Habermas, it's not about uh, communicative action, although I cite Habermas a fair amount. Mm -hmm. But it's also about what it, the choices we make to act in society, and that's where the pragmatists really appeal to me, and where mm -hmm. Aristotle really mm -hmm. appeals to me, because there is the framing of action. And I think that law, a modest rule of law, can help frame actions in society that allow us to build institutions, allow us to see ourselves in communities or in societies, I'm more attracted to society mm -hmm. rather than community, in societies that, that allow for the construction of opportunities for action and opportunities for interaction that are positive mm -hmm. and aren't just about uh, creating uh, oppositional moments, yes. but about yes. creating communicative moments. Questions for Stephen? Randall, we'll use the microphone because we've, we've got an audience, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, fascinating, Stephen. I just had a question about timing. <laughs> and one of the things you said was a bit of a trigger for me. This is the uh, third generation. Uh, you said that this is the first generation that wouldn't have it as, as good as their parents. I've been hearing since, that for since, since the 1950s. I've been, I've been hearing, <laughs> no, I'm not going to let you go on this. Um, I've been hearing that for 35 years. Yeah. I'm Gen X. I was the first generation, then the millennials, and now Gen Z is the third generation that's been hearing that, despite the fact you went into slight 
Harold Macmillan mode, an <laughs> Oxford, not a Cambridge man, I would add, we've have, despite the fact that we've never had it so good. So that's, inequality has existed on a superlative scale since at least the late 1980s, point one, point yeah, two, yeah. deindustrialization, the other great driver of inequality, well that mostly occurred in the 1980s and 1990s, not, not recently. So that's all pretty old to be a contemporary cause. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if two factors, one of which you mention, the other which you don't, aren't relative to the causal explanation. Uh, the technology, mm -hmm. um, you're off Twitter, I stay off now, it's uh, a cesspool. <laughs> but technology in, in, in general, uh, social media has allowed, and the al algorithms reinforce this, the creation of an utterly alternative narrative such that despite four years of corruption, theft, misogyny, lying, and an armed insurrection, 50 point something percent of Americans are willing to vote for Donald Trump again. So isn't technology driving this? Well, question, I certainly, I do talk about question that. Question one. Yes. Question yeah. two, how would a modest rule of law uh, fight it? And question three, uh, Jan Asman's argument about cultural memory that after uh, three generations, about 75 years, we start to forget. And what really worries me is that uh, this is like 1910 or 1911, um, rather than the 1920s or even the 1930s, right. Right. where a situation th where things are actually pretty good, a growing number of people, including in Sweden, one of the most equal in the world, are willing to tear it all down. Uh, so certainly, um, the technology piece I do think is absolutely relevant. There's no question about that, and I think it's you know it's I don't want to just get into this frame that it's all about social media. I think it's way more complicated than that. Social media is highly relevant, uh, and I just, I've stayed off it for my whole life for like quite consciously, uh, and I'm very glad I I did. I have to say. Um, but it's more than, than that. I think it's also in technology, all of the worry that somehow technology is fundamentally, or the new technologies that are evolving, and particularly artificial intelligence, have the capacity either to um, make humans irrelevant, and you know that's the existential question that people like Joshua Bengio talk about, or, or Jeff Hinton now, uh, but much more than that, that there are, there are or more immediately, there are real risks to human uh, jobs, to human uh, safety, uh, to democratic safety, if I may put it that way, uh, that AI is, is creating. And there's also a sense in which AI and other technologies are taking the humanity away from humanity. When you I, I use the example of the portrait of Edmund Bellamy which was um, a portrait created through an early AI um, yes. application that drew upon 15,000 Western paintings of portraits and then created this portrait, which sold for $430,000 at Christie's in London you know, a few years ago. Do you feel like you overpaid? I think so. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, they overpaid. Yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> but, I, but what's interesting to me is I do think that it causes people to start to wonder about creativity and what human creativity is. We saw this in the, the, the writer's strike, right? Mm -hmm. That just happened in Hollywood. Or, uh, I think that's a real fear, and I think that's a different fear, and, a, and a perhaps even more profound fear than the fear of uh, being abused on social media. But I, I'm not denigrating or, or lessening the importance of that. So I do think technology is really important. I mean, there are, Randall, some stats that do start to indicate that over the course, and, uh, and the stats that I'm calling upon are going back to the 1960s. I'm not, I'm not trying to make an argument about this generation. I'm trying to make an argument about what's happened largely since the 1950s forward. And there are, there are stats which indicate that, for example, for most people who are middle class and in the working class, if I may use a terminology that we don't tend to use in North America, uh, that their salaries have stagnated and that they've actually gone backwards. We know that compared to the so-called top 1%. That's the kind of argument I'm, I'm not making arguments. I never use the term Gen X, Gen Z, or anything in the book. So I think this is a longer term phenomenon 
but one that has seemingly gathered a pace, and it may be because of the cultural memory problem, that people don't remember what it was like in the Second World War, et cetera. And in fact, I start the book, I, I cite you quite a bit, uh, at the beginning of the book, because when I was sitting there in COVID, in the middle of, you know, what seemed like a, an extraordinary crisis, and of course was mm -hmm. an extraordinary mm -hmm. crisis, but I kept saying to myself, no, 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 but I'm sitting in an institution that's 800 years old, and it's still here, and it's been through plagues, and it's been through wars, and it's been through depressions, and all of that. So how do we find the way to create our own sense of resilience? That was part of my motivation in all of this. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a very good, I, I commend the book to all of you, of course, but there's, there's a very good part in the beginning where you, where you wrestle with the difference between risk and uncertainty, and, and what's compelling, what was compelling to me about that was, was was the argument not that we're kind of in a moment now where we've been brought here by all these bad forces and things are awful, but that actually people can't comprehend what the future is going to look like. Right. That it is fundamentally uncertain in its outcomes and in the likelihood of those outcomes. And that is unmooring, right? And that's, that's a source of anxiety, so. Yeah, know, and I, I mean, I'm trying to make the case there that we, we just have to, we've been so confident in our ability to predict through economistic analysis, yes, yes. if I may put it that way, what the future is going to hold. And, I mean, I, unfortunately, I end up you know, citing Donald Rumsfeld for the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and all of that. But he's, he was, as I make the, the case I make in the book, is that he was actually drawing on a wellspring of very important sort of um, history of science. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and that there really are these moments where the unknown unknowns are so profound Yes. That, that you feel deeply unsettled. And I think we're in one of those moments, and so we have to draw as well upon these other wellsprings of our own traditions, mm -hmm. our own intellectual traditions, to find ways forward that, that tell us, okay, we can manage the unknown unknowns. It doesn't have to turn us into you know, quivering jelly mm -hmm. that can't make decisions and can't move forward. I mean, I, I, you, we haven't used the, the name yet. Hannah Arendt, for me, is a, is a wellspring through this book. I, I cite her all over the place because I think she actually, despite her own incredibly difficult life, mm -hmm had found a way uh, to think about the future in an optimistic way, surprisingly mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Stephen? Please. Yeah. The microphone's going to be right to your left. So, so we, we speak about the rule of law. Um, the question is, who rules the rulers of the law, the judges? It, it strikes me that here in Canada, we with our Supreme Court, we're, we're quite fortunate in that it seems to be a little question as to whoever is in the court at any given time, that it's doing a good job and people are satisfied. They're, they're satisfied with new appointments who come in almost ex cathedra. Yeah, there has to be a sort of um, an apportioning of uh, provincial. The judges have to come f to represent the different provinces. But apart from that, these decisions come from on high. Nobody seems to make any serious objections and there's no serious assault on on the rule of law. Of course, when we had the Freedom Convoy, I don't know how many times I heard Christian Freeland remind us, and Trudeau, that we are a rule of law country, as though that was a new concept. But the, the question of who rules the rulers, in the US, of course, we have <laughs> judges again are sort of appointed from on high. Yes, they are interrogated, but then, then they, be, they get appointed essentially according to the wishes of the ruling government. And from then on, they're, they're like a football between government and the populace. I mean, look at the, rightly or wrongly, the, the, the abortion decision. I think it's wrong and ridiculous. But nevertheless, it's, it's really eroding, it's eroding the, uh, the authority of the court. So <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm getting. And of course, as you mentioned, there are countries all over where um, courts are under assault. And the latest exactly. is in Britain and, and of course, in the US, in Poland, in Hungary, and, and everywhere. I mean, Israel. almost everywhere outside Canada. Yeah. So, so it's not really a question, but I wonder if you could well, well, address it. It's an important, it's an important issue. Um, 
So with great respect to judges in the room, uh, I think one of the arguments that really emerges in the book is that you can't define the rule of law on the basis of institutional structures. So I don't actually define the rule of law as being intimately related to the role of courts, for example. I actually think that is one of the mistakes that we often make, particularly in uh, uh, countries that have inherited uh, the British traditions, uh, the common law traditions. I think we overemphasize the notion that the rule of law is grounded essentially in, or in, in large measure, in the uh, role of courts within the society. And that goes right back to Dicey, uh, who, who did in one of his, he, he has three sort of conceptualizations of the rule of law. And one of them is that the ordinary courts of the land are really the, the, the key institution. Mm -hmm. I actually think law is much more complicated than that. But your point is really important because I think, and you, you got to it right at the end, if the courts as institutions of a rule of law start to undermine their own legitimacy, then I think they are contributing to the denigration of the rule of law. And I would go so far as to say that the US Supreme Court is in that position now. That because of the way the appointment processes work in the United States and the seeming willingness of now a majority of the court to adopt positions that are really based in instrumentalism, mm -hmm. and that's the argument I make right at the end of the book, that a purely inter instrumental understanding of the law is in fact an undermining of the rule of law. I think unfortunately, and this is a really damaging moment, that the US Supreme Court may in fact be engaged in exactly that process of undermining its own authority, but more than that, undermining the very concept of the rule of law. And we do see it in other countries as well, sadly enough, where courts have been co-opted. I did some work in Indonesia many years ago, and I met with the entire Supreme Court. I think there were 24 of them. It was a very big court. Uh, and it was utterly apparent that there was really no concept of, of a rule of law uh, mm -hmm. undermine, uh, underlying the work of that court. It was a court that was corrupt, if I may say with great respect, and a court that really saw itself as simply doing the will of whomever it felt was going to uh, reward it most, which was usually government. You have a very, um, I'll come to you in a second, there's a very good story, actually, it's not a story because it's true, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a vignette you share with us in the book about, about uh, visiting Nepal and, and how the experience there captured for you the, you know, the, the claims about the rule of law versus the reality of rule of law. Do you want to share that with us? It was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life, which is why, I mean, this is partly why I wanted to write this book, because mm -hmm. it's not an autobiography or anything like that, but I, there were just moments which seemed to, for, for me, just capture insights that, I, that were really important to me. So I'll try to shorten the story, because it's quite long, but I, I was chairing the United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances at the time, which is a group that was put together largely after uh, the events in Latin America, in Argentina, which is now being raised again, by the way, where so many people disappeared in Brazil and uh, elsewhere. But I was in Nepal because there were periods where many, many people disappeared at the hands both of the Nepalese government and of Maoist insurgents. And I was there. Um, uh, at a very strange moment, uh, very shortly before we were there, we're the, entire, the, yeah. the entire yeah. royal family of Nepal had been wiped out by the crown prince who killed his father, mother, etc. The uh, person who inherited the throne, uh, which was a dynasty that lasted for a couple of hundred years, the Shah dynasty, um, the last, turned out I met the last king of Nepal. And I met with him as the chair of this working group, and it was a very strange experience because I've been strangely fortunate to meet a number of constitutional monarchs, and I couldn't distinguish the language that he used from that when I met 
Queen Elizabeth or, mm. or when I met the, the Emperor of Japan. All the appropriateness of the role of the king in a constitutional monarchy, uh, support for human rights, independence of the judiciary, all of those things, except that the day before I'd met with the hierarchy of the Nepalese military and it was absolutely clear who actually ran the country. And it was them, it wasn't the king and it wasn't any of the parliamentary um, act actors. But I think the part of the story that you might be referring to, which was this, ex so here was the facade of the rule of law. That's mm -hmm. the point there. And then I met uh, in secret with uh, families of the disappeared, and particularly mothers. And I met with this one particular mother who came up to me at the end of the session. She was probably in her 50s. And through a translator, um, she told me the story. Uh, her a son had disappeared probably a decade before, and she'd tried everything. She'd you know, gone to the court or tried to use the courts, tried to use the political system, et cetera, et cetera. And she took my hands and she looked at me in the, eye, uh, uh, in the eyes and she said, you are my hope, you are my God. I, I mean, I, I was actually, I, I almost collapsed. I, I know that may sound strange, but I just thought, oh my God, heaven, you know, I am no one's God. <laughs> uh, and so I, 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 but I, but I wanted to be responsive to her obvious trauma. And so, um, I, you know, I babbled on about, oh yes, well, you know, the, uh, the United Nations is now looking at the, your son's case. I promise you I'll, I'll raise it with authorities, et cetera, et cetera. But I knew that there was really not much that I could do to help this woman. And it was a really chastening moment. So all of the human rights framework was in place. Here were supposed institutions that were giving rise to the opportunity to correct this wrong, and yet they weren't. Mm. And so it, it's part of the reason that I became so convinced about not overreaching when we think about the role of law in society and not imagining that law can solve all social problems. Why I think a modest rule of law is what we have to hold on to as a crucial thing, but not as a salvation. In the front row. Faced with uh, uh, risks and uncertainties, uh, people tend uh, to find radical and simple solutions more appealing, especially those marginalized groups affected, negatively affected by the factors you mentioned. My question is, um, how can we um, make a modest rule of law appealing to those populations, especially those who have been negatively affected because of inequality, globalization, and the other things, and do not find radical and populist solutions appealing? Mm. Uh, it's a really profound question, um, and I don't think there's an easy answer to that. The last chapter in the book, though, uh, is a plea for the legal profession, and particularly for law students and law teachers, um, because I think that what I argue throughout the book is that communities of practice around law, which are, by the way, not coextensive with lawyers, communities of practice in law can include journalists and diplomats mm. and all sorts of people, uh, sociologists and many others, depending on the, uh, on the set of issues that's being engaged with. But I try to make the argument that we have within people who are trained in the law a, an obligation to try to articulate the law in as clear a fashion as possible and to try to articulate the rule of law in as clear a fashion as possible and not to overclaim about the role that law can play in solving all of the human problems that we face. So I, I remain hopeful that if, if we take our role seriously as people who study law and practice law and are judges, etc., don't overclaim, but that we articulate the importance of the rule of law in non-instrumental terms, and that is really at the end of the day the key, so that law isn't, a, isn't just um, an, a tool or an, an instrument. And unfortunately, I would argue that for much of the 20th century and into our century, that law 
for various different reasons, from various different ideological positions, is nonetheless often treated even by lawyers as instrumental, that that is part of the way that we get around the problem that you've, that you've highlighted. It doesn't solve it, but I think if we can argue about the importance of law as in and of itself a value for society, but not a solver of all problems, that that helps to make a case to people who, who may be looking for easy solutions, that law can still have a role to play because you're not, you're not trying to solve every problem with it, and you're also not trying to, or you can't be accused of using it to advance your own interests. And I think that's really important. I wish I had an easier answer. There isn't one. It does, it does strike me that one of the great challenges uh, when you think about and platform technology is, is one arena of it, but, a, but, but quite a good one, that we have a very sort of justice-based, individual-based notion of how law should work. If yeah. you're harmed online, you should be able to get recourse for it, right? When Absolutely. What we really have to be thinking about is how you take the societal level effects of these things and to bring them down. Exactly, and, do and right. to think yeah. about the institutions that are allowing these things to yes. happen. Yes. I mean, that, that, actually, to go back to, or maybe it was your one of your comments, I mean, I do think that the rule of law can play a role in addressing big platform problems mm -hmm. by not, 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 for example, simply deferring to big tech in saying, if we try to regulate, they're just going to move somewhere else. Yes, I mean, yes. there, there, are, there are a lot of a lot of concrete decisions that we have to take that I think can actually collaboratively work to provide more institutional framing, but it takes political courage to yes, do that. Yes. Last question right here. Yeah. Thanks so much for the presentation. Actually, my question is um, related to your um, the regulation on artificial intelligence. So like you've mentioned, we have anxiety of technology around the society and around the globe. And um, when we're trying to um, do this regulation to regulate the risk around this new technology, there will be challenges. <laughs> challenges such as, for example, like how to set the legal criteria. That criteria we mentioned is so important to transform the social norms into our, our actual laws. And so one of the challenges would be um, like how exactly we can, we can um, set like usable and practical criteria while not like driving out space for like innovation, like, for, yeah. innovation for example. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so how would you balance this kind of risk management and um, innovation that happens within the rule of law? So, so a declaration. Um, the organization that I now head is, is uh, charged with running the national AI strategy for Canada. And of course, I wrote this book before I joined that organization, so I should be clear about that. And we've got the person who actually leads that strategy sitting over there in the corner, so I'm really nervous about answering this question. Uh, but uh, no, uh, look, you're absolutely right. That is the fundamental challenge. Is it's that, and it's often the case when you think about the role that law plays in society. It's often about trying to balance a whole series of different considerations, some of which are interest-driven, and this is an important point in the mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. but others are not just about interests. They're also about notions of identity and notions of humanity and notions of social purpose, etc. So law has to do a lot of complex work, and I think it does it best when it also considers other frames within society and doesn't imagine that it's solving the whole problem in and of itself. So I would think in the area of, of, of regulation of new technologies, uh, my, my instinct would be to be looking for principles rather than rules. And this is often something I believe in quite profoundly in a whole range of circumstances, but I think this is a great example, where you don't want to declare in advance what the right solution is because you frankly don't know, especially with new technologies which are evolving so quickly. So I think it's really important to try to identify the principles that we should be engaging with as we think about the appropriate uh, shaping 
of technologies within society. And I suspect as well that it's important that those principles not just be principles that we think are important within one society, but principles that are derived from really detailed conversations amongst different societies that may have different emphases as they're seeking to create these balances. So it's a complicated process, but it is a complicated question because what you don't want to see happen is the kind of shutting down of creativity and the shutting down of innovation within our society. You also, though, don't want to have a kind of free-for-all that actually allows for the evolution of really dangerous technology. And I think we have seen that. I, I was just at a presentation the other day where, where, where someone made the case, um, a, a colleague from McGill, uh, made the case that we missed the boat on um, social media, that we actually didn't think through carefully mm. in advance where the risks were likely to align and therefore we allowed it to completely get out of control and now we're trying to catch up. And the argument would be here that we have to try not to allow that happen in the case of uh, generative artificial intelligence or even more, our general artificial intelligence, the idea that we just allow a system to be created that thinks for itself without really understanding what the consequences of that might be. Again, no simple answer at all, but principles cross civilizationally or cross, cross nationality. And then I think it is the case that at the end of the day, this will only work if there's international or, or intersocietal collaboration. Because if, it, if we try to do all of this on a nation by nation basis, there will be some nations that race to the bottom and some race, nations that race to the top. And the top could be no innovation and the bottom could be absolute free for all and great danger. Did you choose the cover of the book? I did. Why? <laughs> Probably be partly because I was in England. Uh, it's, an English, it's an English artist. It's meant to signify collaboration and communication uh, as absolutely essential to any understanding of the rule law. I didn't want anything that you know, was a balancing of scales mm. uh, or, or, or you know, justicia yeah. or any yeah. of those things. I wanted Roman, something a that... A Roman portico. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or yeah, exactly, much less you know, the, yeah. the picture of the Supreme Court of the yeah. United States. I wanted yeah. something that said we can, we're in this together and that if we actually coordinate our efforts a little bit, there is a way forward. Yeah. That was the, uh, that's the essence. Well, I can just uh, indulge you with a, with a quick story. In, in 2018, right before Stephen left to go to Cambridge, we had a, we had a big dinner, a party for Peter Monk at, uh, at the president's residence at Highland. And Randall was there. Many people here, here were there. And, and Stephen described the first time he met Peter Monk. And he said, I went home that night and I told uh, Paul and my wife that I'd just met the most remarkable man. And uh, Stephen, I think a lot of us feel like when we, when we interact with you that you are one of the most remarkable people <laughs> we'll, we'll meet. And this, this book was written when you were locked down running one of the world's great uh, universities. Uh, and it represents, it's remarkable that you did it during that time, but it also represents a continual engagement with scholarship despite all the other things that you've done over the course of your career. And I think it is just a remarkable testament to your commitment to a life of ideas that um, you wrote this book uh, and you shared it with us. So it's really our privilege uh, and a remarkable one that you'd spend this last hour with us. So I ask you to join me in thanking Stephen. Thank you, Peter.